You easily have either the training set, right? So I have a bunch of records. You know, those are the attributes. Those things will correspond to the axis, right? So all this plus this plus this will be that vector, you know, uh, x for that particular record. The, 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 the class over here will be yes and no. That will be the, the two distinct values of the y. And, uh, and then we have a, a, a process in which, you know, we deploy some sort of an algorithm to learn a model, right? And, uh, and then once we learn that model, given, you know, a bunch of records that do not have the class label, we'll try and predict the class label, okay? And uh, <clears throat> I guess this classification task is to predict whether or not someone's going to cheat on their tax returns or not. So nobody in this room, of course, right? So, <clears throat> so, so there, there are a whole slew of different methods have been developed for solving the classification problem, right? And you know, have decision trees, rule based, nearest neighbor, neural networks, you know, a bunch of Bayes uh, based methods, you know, support vector machines and others, right? And there are a set of, you know, meta learners so ensemble learner classifiers that ha have been developed, right? So my plan is what I would like to, to give you guys. I'm going to spend about, you know, at least half an hour talking about decision trees. And the reason I'm going to talk about decision trees is not so much because decision trees is the best thing that exists out there by themselves, right? But it's because it's a very simple kind of approach to illustrate some important concept, you know, when it comes about actually building some of those models, right? And, and then we'll talk a little bit about that, okay? And, and then we'll talk a little bit about that and that, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about uh, support vector machines and, and the neural networks, okay? So, <clears throat> so decision trees, right? So, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen decision trees, right? You know, at some point in, 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 in your career, Right? So, so the decision trees, you know, uh, consist of a, of a bunch of nodes. So those are the, the interior nodes of the decision trees, you know, usually correspond to some sort of a, a, a involve one of the variables in, in my data set and, uh, and some sort of a condition, right? And based on the outcome of testing that condition, I'm going to take one branch of the tree versus the other branch of the tree, right? So the, the way you, you interpret a decision tree is that someone will cheat on their tax returns if, uh, if he does not own a house, he is a single or divorced, and he makes more than $8,000, okay? So, <clears throat> so this is, you know, how, how you use a decision tree, you know, to, to predict, you know, a, a particular record. So, <clears throat> so, Given a, a, a data set, right, I can potentially generate a bunch of decision trees, right? And, uh, and one of the, of the whole problem and the, the task of actually building a decision tree is, is to generate it, the, the best possible decision tree for the task, right? And we need to, to think a little bit about you know, how to measure you know, the quality of the decision tree. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to spend some time talking about how to induce the decision trees and some of the things that, you know, that we need to worry about, uh, uh, you know, building the tree. By the way, the process of building the tree is called tree induction, uh, in case you see that thing in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the slides. Okay. So, so the general procedure of building the tree is, uh, so we're giving a database of training records, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, and let's assume that you know, I have a node in my decision tree. I have you know, partially built a decision tree. And I take my database, my training database, right? And I feed them to the decision tree. And there is a subset of the database that ends up you know, traversing that node of the decision tree, right? So getting to that point in the decision tree, okay? So at that point in time, the procedure of actually you know, further growing the tree is, uh, uh, <clears throat> is, you know, I have to pick up one of the variables, make that variable to be the decision variable over here, right? And, and then further route this set of transactions, you know, to, to the different, you know, children of that node, right? And, and the whole process of, of taking that thing and, and splitting it, you know, will end when I get to a node over here in which the class label associated uh, with all the examples that fall there uh, tend to be is the same or nearly the same, right? So it's like a homogeneous leaf node on the decision tree. So, so let, let's walk through an example, right? So, so usually decision trees, you start with an empty decision tree in which you have some sort of a default prediction, right? And the default prediction tends to be the majority of your class labels, right? So, so the simplest decision tree I can build is a decision tree that essentially has just a single leaf node, 
okay? And predicts the majority class. But since very like case, you know, it's gonna be no, okay? So, <clears throat> so then I pick up one of the variables, right? And, you know, make it a decision variable, right? And I have, you know, split, let's say homeowner, you know, yes versus no. And, and if I look at, you know, how the, the records in my database, you know, are routed through the decision tree, you know, three of them go on the left, uh, seven of them go on the right, right? And uh, this is the class distribution, three, zero, and four, three, right? And once I get there, the, the predictions of those two nodes will be, again, no and no, because those are the majority classes, right? Then <clears throat> I continue adding, you know, so, you know, on, on this side, that part is pure, so I don't have to split it any further, right? So that part over here is not pure, so I introduce another variable to do the splitting of the decision tree of that set of databases, right? And it's marital status, and I have single divorce going on one side, married goes on the other side, right? So again, my default prediction now over here becomes yes, which is a majority. Over here becomes no. The, the thing on the left needs to be further split, right, because it's not pure. You know, I get, you know, annual income, I get something like that, okay? At which point in time, so okay, I have, you know, I finished inducing the decision tree. You guys okay? I mean, this is kind of you know, the, the general idea of how, how you build a decision tree out of, of, a, of a set of records like that, okay? So, <clears throat> I mean, there are a number of parameters over here. Why did I pick up homeowner as, as the first variable to, to, to make it the root of my decision tree, right? I mean, uh, you know, maybe another variable will lead to something better, okay? Uh, do I really need to stop when the whole thing is pure? Right. Or is this good enough? Okay, so those are some of the parameters that fall into, into the, the decision tree reduction. Uh, anyway, that they get explored by algorithms that induce decision trees. Okay? Right. Yes? Why were the single and divorce together? Uh, because uh, I'm building decision trees that they're binary, don't have to be binary. Right? But if I'm building binary decision trees, right? So this is actually a very good question, but you know, in, in, you know, in, in, you know, involved a long set of slides describing what goes before that, right? But usually, what you have over here, your attributes have, you know, you know, uh, different types of attributes, right? So I have like uh, categorical attributes that you know, take values from a set, right? I have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ver uh, variables that they are continuous, right? Uh, they have variables that they still take some sort of discrete values, but those discrete values have an order, right? So any times, you know, given this different variety of data. Then the question becomes, you know, what is the form of a test, right? If it's a, if it's a categorical, uh, the form of a test can be, you know, can, can have the, the branching factor, you know, the number of outgoing children of that node can be as many as its distinct value, right? Or it can be an arbitrary split into two subsets, or an arbitrary split of three subsets, right? And a lot of the algorithms that have been developed, you know, explore those possibilities, right? In a continuous attribute, you know, usually the splitting you, you pick up some sort of a value and it says less than that, greater than that, so you have to find, you know, what is that value, right? And uh, so anyway, I mean, the, the, the simplest trees that people tend to build are binary trees, you know, keep things simple, right? At which point in time, when you get to a categorical attribute, you know, you just need to worry about, you know, what are the possible splitting points I have to consider into two sets, right? So, <clears throat> but there's, a, there's flexibility there. Uh, Okay, so again, so, so some of the design issues when I'm using a tree, you know, uh, you know how should the, the training records be split, uh, methods for satisfying the, the, the test conditions, uh, methods for selecting which attribute and split condition to choose, and so forth, right? And then I want to stop, you know, inducing the tree. So all of those things. Uh, so again, the, the question of, you know, multi-way versus binary splits. Uh, there's too many details that you guys want to know about. Uh, <clears throat> so so the, one of the issues has to do there is if, if I'm trying to pick up a variable and let's say I have, you know, 10 choices, right? You know, which variable should I pick, right? And, uh, and usually you tend to do, you have to have some sort of a function of measuring the quality of the split. And the quality of the split is really a function in terms of how pure of children does it generate. Right? I mean, the, the ultimate goal is, is to try to classify, to try to come up with a tree that will get to a leaf node that has stuff from one label, right? So, so the sooner you can get there, the better, right? And picking the variables that will allow you, and, and the particular t 
test condition that you put over there that will allow you to do that split into pure stuff, right? You know, it's, it's usually what gets preferred. And, uh, <clears throat> and, you know, usually you tend to do, you use some sort of a node impurity measure, a way of measuring, you know, how pure a node is in terms of, you know, the distribution. The usual suspects over there, there's something called the Gini index. I'm sure you guys have heard of entropy. And there's something error that you guys probably have the error. And, you know, this, I mean, all three of them are highly related. It's just the difference is, you know, how sharp they are, uh, close to 50-50 splits or not. And, 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 the, and the finding the best split is usually an algorithm like that, right? So, so you compute the impurity measure before the split, you know, either one of those Gini index entropy or, or error, right? So you compute the impurity measure after splitting, okay, so essentially the, the before and after, right? Uh, then you define some sort of a gain, which is uh, essentially the, 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 the after, the, the before and the after, right? Uh, and then you, uh, you pick up the, the, uh, the, the, the variable and the splitting decision associated with that variable, right, that, uh, that maximizes that gain. It's, it's, it's a very much a greedy algorithm for reducing the tree, okay? So it's a, these are, those algorithms are called uh, greedy tree induction algorithms, okay? So, <clears throat> so advantage of decision trees, you know, very, very inexpensive to construct, you know, they're ex extremely fast to classify unknown records. Uh, you can actually interpret them fairly easy because, you know, you can look at the path from the root to the leaf, right, and read the variables along the path and actually try to build a story around it. You know, <laughs> that's, that's the way of presenting results, you know, to, to, to your boss at some point, right? So, the, hey, here's what my decision tree said, right? So it's something that, you know, you can actually, you know, make sense out of it, okay? Uh, <clears throat> it can easily handle a redundant or irrelevant attributes. Uh, now, so you have put that easily here in quotes, because I'll show you an example that you see it cannot really do that, all that well in certain cases. So, <clears throat> so the problem is that the space of all possible decisions is exponentially large, right? So, you know, even though we can use a greedy approach to select the best decision tree, even among the possible trees using that greedy approach can be quite a few, and the question becomes, you know, which one we select. Uh, it fails to take into account interactions between variables. Every, every decision node involves holding a single variable, right? You cannot say something if x minus y raised to the power of 3 is less than 25, in which x and y are attributes. You guys get that? For instance, you cannot find a circle. If I'm within the circle, go left. I'm outside the circle, go right. right? I mean, this is something that, that cannot really capture, OK? And, uh, <clears throat> So, so those are some of the limitations of decision trees, okay? But the reason I want to talk about decision trees is I want you guys to understand the, the important concept about supervised learning that has to do with overfitting. So, <clears throat> so there are usually three types of errors that we need to worry about in, in supervised learning, okay? So... Make sure my black shirt does not get even more black when I go like that. Uh, so, <laughs> so there are three things that we need to worry, uh, three types of errors that we need to worry when we talk about supervised learning, right? So, so one is called the uh, uh, the training error, right? So, so, so those are the errors committed on the training set. So let's assume for now right, that I build my decision tree, right? And my stopping criteria is not until I get to a pure node, but my stopping criteria is uh, until I get to a node that is 99% pure. Okay, so, so then as part of my building the model, I can potentially be introducing a 1% error. You guys okay? So this is what is called the training error. Okay, so there's a, there's a test error, right, which is a, a errors committed on the test set, right? So when, when I apply my, my decision tree on an unlabeled data set, right, then I get some sort of an error, right? You know, if I'm gonna compare against some sort of a ground truth data, okay? So, and then, and then again, this is specific to the particular test data set, okay? And then there's a generalization error. So the generalization error is the expected error of a model in a randomly selected subset of records from the same distribution, okay? You guys agree with that? So, so this is called a generalization error. So I have my training error, 
right? If, uh, if I can, I can, I can build a model that has zero training error, or I can build a model that has a, 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 a training error that I'm willing to tolerate for whatever reason. Okay. Then I have the test error, where someone gives me a test set, I apply my model, I get some sort of an error. Okay. And then I have an error that I get from think of that as another type of test set that is has exactly the same distributional characteristics as my training set. Okay, so, so you may argue, you know, what is different between generalization error and the test error? Well, test error, I have no guarantee that comes from the same distribution. Okay, I mean, I may have learned a model of data, right, from last year, and I'm going to predict the data from this year, right? I mean, the underlying distribution of the data from last year may have changed from the data of this year. Right? So, so I may have you know, some error, right? Because really my data is different. Okay? The generalization error is essentially it's a subset of records from the same distribution. So, so you assume that, that your underlying distribution that generates the data has not changed from when you train it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm mining the audio signals. So, uh, so, so you assume that the, the, the distribution of the, of the data in which you try to apply your method, right, it hasn't changed, right, and you get some sort of an error, okay? So this is called generalization error. So the best way to think of it, you know, what would be the expected error on unseen data, on data not used in training, but they're coming from the same distribution as the data that it was in training, okay? In general, that would be very similar to the test error, but I have no guarantees about what the test error, where the test error is, the test data is coming from. Okay, so so that's why you know we tend to decouple those three different errors. Okay, do those things kind of make sense? I mean, those are those are just definitions. Okay, so so let's look at a particular example that we're going to use to to, to study something, right? So so this is an example that consists of a bunch of blue guys and a bunch of uh, red guys, right? So it's a blue crosses, I believe, and uh, red circles. And I'm sorry for those of you guys who are colorblind, but I think you should be able to tell those two colors apart, even though they're not red and blue, right? So the blue are the guys in the middle, the red are the stuff around, right? And, and uh, in, this, in this particular example, you know, 10% of the data are used for training and 90% of the data are used for testing, okay? So, <clears throat> So this is a, a, so what I'm plotting over here, it's, it's the training error, okay, uh, as the number of nodes of the decision tree, okay? So I'm inducing a decision tree, right? But I stop my tree induction after I include one node, two nodes, three nodes, four nodes, and so forth, okay? Using a greedy tree induction algorithm, okay? So, so what you see over here is that, you know, when I have, you know, uh, uh, essentially no nodes, right? I have uh, essentially roughly no, you know, you know, almost 50% error, right? Because you know, the, the distribution of those two things were pretty balanced, right? As I include nodes, decisions in my tree, right? My, this is a training error, right? My training error goes down, right? You know, early on goes down dramatically, right? Uh, and afterwards, you know, slowly goes down, right? You know, once I include it close to almost like 150 plus nodes in my decision tree, I'm, I'm down to zero, okay? So, so this is a picture that, you know, in, when we talk about machine learning, you know, usually we talk about models, right? And also to talk about model complexity, you know, how complicated my model is, okay? So in the decision tree, the notion of a model complexity has to do with the number of nodes of the tree, right? You know, how big the tree gets, okay? This is the notion of a complex model, right? So as we increase the complexity of my model, right, my ability to model the training data improves, right? And this is generally true, right? If you're using some sort of a machine learning, like a supervised learning method, right, in which as you make the method more and more and more complex, if you do not see that, go find another method, okay? So, so that the, the part in general holds, okay? And, uh, and by the way, this is what the tree looks like over here, right? 
So, so you have a decision point first. I don't know which one came first. This is anything on this side will be called circle. Anything over here will not be called whatever will be the default class, right? Then on that side over here, I split it like that, right? Then on that side over here, I split it like that. And then I split it like that, right? So each of those, you know, perpendicular lines over here it represents a decision binary in the, in, in the decision tree, okay? So, so after adding, you know, one, two, three, four nodes, right? I can essentially peel out the stuff around the circle, right? And stand in the middle of the circle, right? I will call it as pluses, right? And everything else I'll call it circles, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> and, and here is how the tree looks like somewhere here. So, so here's what the decision tree looks like, you know, halfway through, through that exercise, right? It's a very complex decision tree, right? And each successive node, essentially what it does, it peels off just a tiny little bit some of the misclassified examples, right? So that's why you see the training error slowly, you know, going down, okay? So, <clears throat> so the question there becomes, right, you know, if, uh, if, if, if you get, get to select, right, you know, which decision tree is better? Is it the one that has four nodes, right? Or is it the one that has 50 nodes, right? I mean, in terms of a training error point of view, that one has a lower training error, right? That one has a higher training error. That one looks ugly. That is elegant. You guys agree with that? Okay. So, so we introduce the whole concept of, of uh, so now let's look at the test error, okay? And, uh, and, and the test error over here is essentially the, the points like which I did not use for training, right? And the points came from the same distribution, right? So this is the same thing as a generalization error. You guys remember my, my picture, right? So I had a bunch of circle stuff in the middle and a bunch of stuff, and I said, I, I said what, I used 10% for training, 90% for test, right? But the points were generated from the same distribution. So this is really a generalization error, even though it's a test error, okay? So, so the blue is a training error, right? And as I build a model, right, I use it to predict the test set, okay? And I measure the test, the tra the test set error, right? So you can see that the test error tracks the training error, right? As I make my model more complicated, right? And I learn, you know, something deeper, right? Then, and I apply my test set, my performance on the test set improves, right? So it's a very nice track, okay? And if I go beyond those nine nodes, it looks something like that, right? My training error keeps on going down, okay? But my test error after that point keeps on going up. You guys agree with that? So that kind of plot to a large extent happens on any supervised learning algorithm when you have the ability to change the complexity of the model, okay? Uh, <clears throat> let's say in a, in, a, in a neural network, for instance, you know, that thing will happen if I decided to add a couple more hidden layers. I mean, that's part of the model complexity, right? In a support vector machines, which, you know, you, we'll, we'll get to that, what it means, right? You know, that that can happen is because, you know, I have decided to use a much more sophisticated kernel function, right? that has significantly more parameters, you know, you know much more, significantly more complicated, okay? So, uh, so, so this is really, you know, what is happening. And the question there really, the, the ultimate, I would say, challenge or in, in, in supervised learning is, is you want to be able to have some sort of a classifier that has a huge amount of learning capacity. In other words, it can learn, right, and minimize the training error, right? But at the same time, prevent that from happening. Yes. Uh, is there a reason why it diverges like that? We'll get to that. Okay. But but you can kind of see it in in. Let me see. Uh, okay, you can kind of see it here. Let me tell you why you can kind of see it here. So, 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 so look at uh, look at that rectangle over here, right? I mean, the declassifier will say that guy is pluses, right? Because the sample that I used from 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 the 
as a training set, right? It just happened to be lucky not to have any circles there, right? But if you guys look at, the, at, at, at that part over there, right, the, the circle is really here, and this is really the boundary of that circle, right? Once you put the remaining 90% points over there, right, the majority of them will probably be circles, okay? And, and this is where the error occurs. So the error doesn't happen here, right? The error happens in those little slivers that have been created around here, right? To that, and then based on whatever happened to be the majority for my random sampling to create the 10% training set, right? You know, may have correctly figured out it was a circle or may have figured out that it's, that it's, a, that it's a plus. And, you know, the other thing is over here. You know, look at that, that guy, right? So the tree, at that point in time, what it fit, it fit the noise that existed in my, in my, my data generation, right? And once I put the remaining 90%, which, right, you know, I think those guys were somewhere here, right? Once you put the remaining 90%, you'll see that the 90% is really the, the, the circles, right? So really, this is what is happening. It's, it's, as the complexity of the model increases, you know, the ability of the model to feed the noise and not the signal improves. That's bad, okay? Because that noise will not generalize, okay? So, so there, that's why you tend to talk about, you know, in supervised learning about two terms, you know, underfitting and overfitting, right? So an underfitting is, is when uh, we haven't yet fit the data, right? We, we're still operating somewhere here, right? That's the whole idea for an underfitting, right? So a classifier still has the capacity to learn a more complicated model without falling into that area. Right? And overfitting is when it gets into that area. Okay? So it gets to the point in which you know, it's it, it, it starting to fit in the noise, right? And the outliers in the data set, right? And it's, it's missing the big picture. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so again, the, 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 the reasons for model overfitting, right? So presence of noise, uh, lack of representative samples, right? And then the third part that is, uh, that is, is a multiple comparison procedure, right? And, uh, and this is something that, you know, it takes a while for people to realize that this is a problem. And uh, so I have three slides for you guys. It's a really cute slides, okay? So, so consider the task of predicting where the stock market will rise or fall in the next 10 trading days, okay? So let's assume that the random guess of being correct is 50%, even though the last 100 or so days, you know, that's probably not the right number, right? So, <clears throat> okay, and then you make 10 random guesses in a row, right? And then the probability that you are correct in, it, in it, at, at least eight of them, right? You know, you do the math, comes to 0 0.05, right? So you have 50 50 chance to be correct once, right? But if I do 10 things in a row, right? then the probability of being correct in, in, in at least eight of them is only 0.05. I mean, there's nothing out of the ordinary here. You guys hear that? So now, so let's get 50 analysts, like a stock analyst, right? So, and each analyst makes 10 random guesses, and you choose the analyst that makes the most number of correct predictions, okay? So the probability that at least one analyst make at least eight correct predictions, right, is 0.9399. In other words, you pull 50 analysts, each analyst make 10 random predictions, right? And then you look among those 50 guys who made those 10 random predictions in which each random sequence of 10 random predictions has only 5% probability of being correct more than eight times, right? If I ask you know, the max out of those 50, what the number is, and the number is roughly 0 0.94. You guys agree with that? Okay. So, <clears throat> so, so why is that important, right? So many algorithms employ the following kind of greedy strategy. You have an initial model, right? Then uh, you alternate between a new model and prime, that is the old model plus something else, right? So you, you, you expand your tree, okay? 
and where the something else, the amma, right, uh, is a component that is added by comparing a bunch of different ways of adding a component and then selecting the best. Okay, so going back to the previous example, each gamma is one of those analysts, right, that makes a, some sort of a, a, a selection of, of, let's say, decision point, splitting point. Okay, and then among all of those splitting point decisions, you select the best. So, so your overall thing is some sort of a best out of the different choices. This is the, the multiple tests over here, right? So even if each test over here, it's random, okay, the probability that the maximum of those random things to be good is pretty high. You guys agree with that? Okay, and this is, this is really the structure that decision tree follow. I mean, you have a greedy method that every given node, right? You know, you pick up a random a variable, right? You evaluate a bunch of splitting points, right? Among the splitting points for that variable, especially as like a continuous variable, you pick the one that gives you the best result, right? Because you think there is something that is capturing over there, okay? And then uh, among those best, you pick the best, right? And, and, and you'll be picking essentially you know, the analyst among those 50 random predicting analysts that happens to be correct on those 10 days, right? That is not the signal that you're capturing in the data, okay? So here's the, the, the pictorial view of that, okay? So I have a data set over here that, is a, that has, you know, X and Y variables, right? They, they have the pluses and, uh, and, and the circles, okay? So this is like a two variable data set, okay? And I add an additional 100 noisy variables. So I have a data set that has 102 variables. Okay? So, <clears throat> and, and the noise is, is you know, is a, uh, is a sense generated from a uniform, you know, distribution along the X and Y of as attributes. Okay? So, and then I have that 102 variable data set, right? And I induce decision trees. Okay, so, so here is how the training in the tester will look like if I restrict myself to only use the X and Y variables, attributes. You guys okay? So this is how the test and training error looks like if I do not put that restriction in which the model can pick up any of the other 100 randomly noisy variables that I have generated. Okay, so, so, so what is happening is that <clears throat> You know, if you look at the training error, right, it's able to, to significantly pick up variables over here that will reduce, I'm sorry, that will reduce the training error, okay? But then, you know, you have the test error behaving the way it's behaved over there, right? So essentially picking stuff, you know, that, that makes no sense. What's the lower graph? It's when you restrict yourself to only pick up the X and Y variables. The low graph is the no error graphs. Wait, 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 wait. <clears throat> Using only X and Y as attributes. What other attributes? I have the X and Y attributes, plus for each point I generate 100 noisy. Oh, oh okay, so you generated 100 noisy, more noisy attributes. Yep, so every point now has 102 attributes. Okay? But because of that kind of multiple, you know, testing, right, and we select the best out of all possible, you know, uh, splitting points on those continuous attributes, and among all the best of the continuous attributes, right, it will be picking those noisy guys, and that's something what it's doing over there, you know, to be building the tree from, right? And it will do a pretty good job, right, you know, after picking, you know, building a tree that has close to 100 nodes, they have zero error, okay? But you know the, the, the test error, right? You know it you know goes up, then a little bit goes down, and then kind of you know, pretty much you know stay the way it is. Yeah. Wouldn't the x and y attributes be the best? Not necessarily. I mean, I mean they will be the best after the first you have the, the first couple of splits, right? But after that, you know, even the other things will be peeling stuff over here, right? And then, and then you get to the point in which, I mean, I have a hundred variables, 
right? Even though they're randomly generated, one of them may actually have a much better splitting point than something else, because you're taking the max out of essentially 102 variables. So, I mean, this is an interesting experiment to construct about the whole, you know, I mean, there's a, I mean, statisticians, are, uh, I mean, you know, people study the whole, you know, multiple, multiple test problem in statistics, you know, extensively, and especially if you do any, anything in life sciences, right? You know, uh, people have been trained, right, to, to look at you with a strange eye, you know, when you say I select the maximum out of my 20 variables or 100 variables, right? Because, you know, that's, that's very risky, you know, in terms of, you know, what you're actually modeling there. Okay, <clears throat> so overfitting results in decision trees are more complex. You know, training error does not improve, uh, does not provide a good estimate of how well the tree uh, will, will perform on previously unseen records. And there's a way of some estimating the generalization error of the model, okay? And, uh, and in the context of a decision tree, right, they, they are a couple ways of, uh, of simplifying, actually, there's a slide that I, I dropped over here. There's a way of estimating the generalization error, right? So in, in, in supervised learning, there are a set of principal methods that can actually have theoretical bounds and generalization error, right? And, you know, support vector machines is a prototypical example. But most of the other methods do not really have a sufficiently strong theory to give you bounds, I mean, analytical bounds on the generalization error, right? So the way you get an estimate of the generalization error bound, right, is by using essentially part of your training set as what's called a validation set, right? to estimate each error. So there's something that you don't use it for training, but you use it to actually predict, right? And because this is coming from the same as the training set, it has the same distributional characteristics, and you use, essentially, you build a model, you use a validation set, you estimate the performance, right? And, and in general, you can keep on making your model more and more, more complicated until the performance of the validation set starts becoming worse, at which point in time you stop, okay? So it's very, you know, it's a very ad hoc way of, of dealing with that, but that's, that's really how it's done. Uh, so I'm going to skip that because I'm going to give you guys something you know, more exciting. So, so I, I said, you know, decision trees is not a type of classifier that, you know, people should be getting excited about. You know, I was partially incorrect with that. You know, decision trees is actually a very robust classifier, but not by itself, right? Uh, in the context of ensemble methods, you know, decision trees uh, are called random forests. I don't know if you guys have heard term that, that, that name. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and they're actually very powerful, right? So what are the ensemble methods, okay? So the idea of ensemble method, instead of building one classifier, uh, you construct a set of classifiers, okay, from the training data. And then you predict the class label by combining predictions from those multiple classifiers, okay? So those ensembles are very powerful. I mean, even, you know, the, the, the very fancy deep neural networks that people have developing nowadays are essentially ensemble classifiers, right? So they, they, they build a hundred of those neural networks and then they, they combine them, okay? And, and the idea behind ensemble classifiers, even as it works, is, is the following. Suppose there are 25 base classifiers. So I have 25 individual classifiers, right? And each classifier has an error rate of 35%, okay? So in other words, it's the 65% of the time is accurate, okay? So, so assume the errors made by the classifiers are correlated, meaning that, you know, the, you know, there's no correlation between when two classifiers will make a correct or incorrect prediction, right? So those are independent classifiers, okay? So, and, uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, so then the probability that they ensemble you know, makes a, 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 a wrong prediction is given by that. So remember, I have 25, and assuming the way I, I use the ensemble by doing a majority vote, right? So it's like a binary classification problem, right? And, you know, the majority class is my prediction, right? In a 25 base classifier, if, if what I need, I need at least 13 of those guys to agree, okay? Or, or 13 of those guys to agree to make an incorrect prediction, okay? So then that probability is only 0 0.06, okay? Remember, I started with an error rate of 35% for each of my base classifiers. I have 25 of them. They are independent. They predict. I combine the predictions by doing just a majority, right? Then the probability of having an error drops to 6%. 
OK? So and this is kind of you know, a plot over here that shows you know, how that thing happens. So the, the x-axis is the, the, the base classifier's error, right? And, and the y-axis is the ensemble's error, right? So if my base classifiers have a very uh, uh, that should not be an error. That should be an accuracy. Uh, <clears throat> if my base classifiers have a very low accuracy, right? You know the ensemble does not help, right? But uh, once you know that accuracy improves, right? The whole thing you know improves. Right? It's the amplifying effect. OK? So that's why ensemble classifiers work. So, so the basic approach of those things, have the original, the way I build those ensembles, right, the, 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 the common way of doing it, is I have my original training set. I somehow generate a bunch of subsets of the original training set. Right? I build classifiers here. OK? And, and then I combine those classifiers to give them the prediction. And uh, <clears throat> And the approach that I create the training sets is something like that. It's, it's manipulate data distribution like a resampling method. So, you know, there are methods things like a bagging and boosting, if you guys have ever heard those methods. So ma manipulate input features like a, in, in a feature subset selection. What random forests do, if I have my training record has you know, is described by 100 features, you know, they create training sets containing only subsets of those features, random subsets of those features. Okay. And then it's, it's essentially the entire training set, which is a subset of the features is fed to a decision tree, right? And I build 100, 200 decision trees, right? And then I vote, OK? And random forest is probably, it's a fairly robust classifier, right? And in many cases, you know, it performs equally well as, you know, some of the more sophisticated stuff that people have developed, right? And uh, so it's, it's a very powerful technique in which it takes a classifier. I mean, your base classifiers have to be, have at least some uh, ability to distinguish, right? I mean, if, if the base classifier accuracy is less than 50%, that thing will not work, right? But if your base classifiers have a f greater than 50% accuracy, right, then by combining those things, you have an amplification in the whole process, OK? OK. Oh, yeah, I'm going to talk about the, the hot thing nowadays, artificial neural networks. The, the hot old thing these days. So <clears throat> I hope everybody has heard artificial neural networks nowadays, right? Yes? So this is just like software engineering that they just keep on reinventing the wheel? Yeah. OK. <laughs> Pretty much. That's what it is. OK, so no, I'm just pausing because I'm trying to figure out you know, how, how slow quickly should I go. Uh, Okay, let's go with the, the whole linear perceptron idea because we, we need to use it, right? So, so I have a bunch of records, right? So, so each row over here represents a record, right? And, and I have some sort of a black box, right? So what I want to do is I want to feed in the, the variables, right? And I'm going to get out of my black box the output, which is the class, okay? So, and, uh, and I would like my, my output to satisfy something like that, right? So, so y should be 1. If at least uh, two out of the three inputs are one, right? Uh, otherwise, you know, y should be, I believe, minus one. Okay, that, that's what I did. Okay, so <clears throat> so so one way to do that is to, to design a black box that looks something like that, right? So it it takes that inputs, right? It connects with some wires through a function over here. Those wires have some sort of a weight over here, whose purpose is to multiply that weight with the input value, right? When they get over here, this is a summation. I add up those things, right? And, uh, and then I, you know, I have some sort of a threshold, right? And, and then I take the sign of those things. So essentially, I compute uh, that part over here, OK? So you guys OK with that structure? Okay. So this is really nothing more than, and then the sign is just a function that, you know, if the thing is positive, we'll say plus 1. If the thing is negative, we'll tell me minus 1. Right? So it's, a, it's a sign transfer function. OK? <clears throat> the thresholding function, how do, you, how do you decide what type of thresholding function to use, whether it's sigmoidal or? Well, we haven't got there yet. <laughs> this is just summation. This is just a linear function. OK? So, 
So, so this is you know, the, the, the famous perceptron model. You know, some of you may have heard it, right? In which it's, it's, you know, it can be represented like that. Right? So I have the summation value that I have over here. Uh, T is at uh, uh, the, uh, the, the threshold value, which I can, in general, make the, th the threshold value is also something that I estimate. Right? And I can treat the threshold value as the, the weight associated with the x sub 0 input. And I can write it like that. So this is the same thing as that. That goes from y equals 0 to d, as opposed from 1 to d. And the 0 part is here to model t. OK, that's OK. So, so this is you know, the, the perceptual model. So what we're trying to do over here is, is you're trying to learn uh, uh, w is a mild parameter, right? So it's all those weights and those links, right? That essentially do a linear combination of the input values. Okay, and uh, and give you some sort of a value, and my prediction is going to be the positive or negative. Okay, so <clears throat> so this is you know a single layer network, right? Uh, and uh, I don't need that. And and the way I tend to train those things is I do it in sort of a iterative fashion, right? So I fit in training instances, right? Uh, I, I look at the at the prediction, right? If my prediction is correct, right, I, you know, I don't do anything. If my prediction is incorrect, right, I update the w, which is the model parameter, right, uh, to take into account the example that was mispredicted, right, with some sort of a learning weight. Okay, so this is an example of a, of a gradient descent optimization, which, uh, you know, you, you can. You know, so this is something that, that has to do with the target value, right? And this is the prediction, right? It's going to be either plus one or minus one, right? If they agree, that would be zero, so that doesn't do anything, right? If they disagree, that would be a value, right? So it's a scalar value. That is a scalar value, right? And, and this is a training example that is added to my model, okay, to give you my new model. So, so my model moves towards the direction of the example that I have misclassified. Okay, that, that's uh, that's really what what you do over here. Okay, so <clears throat> so this kind of model, you know, is learning essentially that linear that line that W is a representation of a line or a hyperplane in a high dimensional space, right? And is can learn a model that will separate a positive class from a negative class, right? If those two classes are linearly separable, meaning they can be separated via a hyperplane. You guys said that the notion of linearly separable or not? Those are linearly separable. Those are not linearly separable. Okay? There is no line that will separate those things here. Single line, right? I mean, there's a circle that will separate those, but that's not a line. Okay. So, <clears throat> so anyway, but the perceptron, the linear perceptron, was essentially what what started neural networks thirty plus years ago, right? So, so the idea there is is to replace that linear function that you had over here on those nodes with a nonlinear function, OK? And that nonlinear function can potentially learn things like that, OK? So the general idea of a neural network is, is something like that. This is a neural network with one hidden layer, one input layer, one output layer, right? So on the input layer is where I fit in my variables that describe my objects, right? So like uh, the, 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 the values on the record, on the, on the features that I have, right? Then I have those. Uh, uh, those input, uh, those hidden layer nodes, right? That what they do is they sum up the values from the inputs with some sort of a weight that they learn for those links. So this is a, a weight that they learn on those links. They take that added value, that add, the value that comes as a result of that summation, right? And, and they fit into some sort of an activation function, right? That activation function in general is nonlinear. So it's not like a, it's a linear function, but can, can have different shapes, OK? And, and usually, I have multiple of those nodes in the hidden layer. And that thing, again, is fed into some sort of an output layer that again gets summed up over here 
potentially apply to another linear or nonlinear function, okay, and give me the prediction over here, the output y. Okay? And within that model, what you're trying to do is the, the model parameters, so the stuff that you're estimating during the training, are the weights on those links, right? That you use them to multiply the input values to get the summation, and then the value that you have added over here is the input to a nonlinear function that generates an output, okay? And that output goes over here, right? You learn a weight over here, right, to multiply by that output that comes from here. You sum them up over here, and you get the prediction over here. You guys get a rough idea about what's going on, right? So every red line over here is a weight that you have to estimate, right? Every node, it uses those weights to multiply, to think of it, to scale the input values that come in and sum them up, okay? And that, that result there becomes input to a nonlinear function, like a cosine function or a sine function or a tangent function, right? That generates something else, okay? And, and then you get a prediction over here. If the prediction is correct, great. If the prediction is wrong, then you go and update the weight. It's called a back propagation, using a formula very similar to the one that I showed you before, okay? But it's meant for nonlinear updates. Okay, so you're fitting the training examples. You look at the output. If the output has an error, you go back and you update the weights. You keep on doing that, doing that until you know you you give up, right? Until you know you stop getting error. Okay, we cannot get things any better, right? But this is kind of you know the, the basic idea of one of a, a neural network with one hidden layer, right? So the parameters in that model is, for instance, you know how many nodes do I have here, right? Another parameter is how many hidden layers do I have? You know, of course, I have multiple hidden layers. So the deep neural network, what it means, it means they have multiple hidden layers. I, you know, traditional neural networks just had a single hidden layer. And what people were doing, they would just make them wide, having a large number of nodes. Okay? The, the deep neural network craze of the last you know, five, six years, you know, instead of doing that, they add levels of hidden nodes. right? And those things are not necessarily too wide. They can be wide, but they're, they're fairly deep, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> and then that function over here is uh, there have been a, a bunch of functions have been introduced historically. So I can have a linear function which you know, doesn't give me anything more than the linear percept term, okay? Uh, you know, a sigmoid function is, is another function that you know, kind of has a nonlinear you know, response to it, right? can have a, some sort of a sine function or a tangent function. The, one of the recent developments in the last few years, the problem with, the, with both a tangent and a sigmoid function, they have what's called a, a vanishing gradient. You know, when you actually try to optimize them and you take a gradient for them, then uh, you, there's a big range of, that, uh, of, of the values, of the input values in which you, know, you have no guidance of which direction to be optimizing it. So essentially, long story short, the optimization algorithms get stuck in local minima, okay? So, so one of the most recent developments in neural network is they introduce what's called a, 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 a rectified linear unit as an activation function that looks, if I remember correctly, uh, something like that, okay? That, you know, you know does not suffer from those gradient, uh, vanishing gradients, okay? So allow the optimization algorithm to actually get to a much better local minimum. Okay? So, <clears throat> uh, okay. So, so multi-layer artificial neural networks uh, have been proven to be, to be what's called a, 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 a universal function, function approximators, meaning that if they can approximate any function, period. Okay, so that means that if the underlying model, right, so remember you're trying to, your model is some sort of a function of the inputs to give me the class, okay? You don't know what that function is, okay? You can assume that it's a linear function, but that's a big assumption. You can assume that it's, let's say, a second order function, but that's a big assumption, okay? Or you can assume that I have no idea what that function is, okay? But I want to approximate it, okay? 
So, so you can build a multi-layer artificial neural network that can approximate any function. You guys hear that? I mean, this is like it's a, it's a universal function approximator. Okay? And, uh, and, and this is, you know, you know, where the power of the, uh, of, the, of the deep neural network comes in, right? The ability to approximate any function, you know, without any prior knowledge what that function is. Okay? Of course, in order to do that, they need a huge amount of training data. That's why people never used artificial neural networks until the last five, six years, when, number one, we had the computing resources to do that, and we had access to a large time of data for certain applications. Okay? But that is really the power of artificial neural networks. Okay, okay, okay. okay. I'm not giving you a headache. Um, <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> um, no, I'm just thinking, so, so, I mean, if you build a like, one layer, one of these neural networks, that's not going to be able to approximate any function. So are there any results on how many layers you need to, to make this happen? <coughs> or is that something that's sort of dynamically adjusted as you're learning? There is a result uh, that has to do with, the, I mean, there's a theory that's, there, there are theoretical bounds on the complexity of the neural network to approximate functions of a certain number of variables. But, I mean, Nobody is really trying, this is an interesting theoretical result, meaning that the model has the ability to express complex stuff, right? You know, nobody is building those neural networks at that limit. Right. To do that. Right? But, 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 but you want to build one that's <coughs> good enough for my problem at hand. Yeah, that's right. right. And how much black magic goes into that building? A lot of black magic. Okay. <laughs> And that's why those guys get paid, you know, fairly decent salaries who, who do that stuff, right? So, so anyway, but, but the, the, that bullet over there is more from a st standpoint of the learning capacity of the model. Right? And you guys, it's very important. If I'm learning a linear model, right, that has a finite learning capacity. It can only learn like a line. Okay? You know, it cannot even learn a circle. Right? I mean, circle is not a line. Okay? I mean, artificial neural networks, in principle, you know, given a sufficiently complex neural network, right, in terms of the, the number of hidden layers or the width of the, la of the network, right, can be a universal function approximator. So, so there, there is a learning capacity of the, of the methodology to do that. You know, it doesn't mean that we'll learn it, right, because I may not necessarily have enough examples to estimate those things, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, so we have now, because of the, of the recent work on you know, activation function, the ability to actually train them without getting stuck in local minima, there has been a lot of work the last two or three years along the black magic on how to prevent them from overfitting, right? because you know, neural networks you know, have been notorious bad in overfitting. So, so people will have developed you know, a bunch of fairly ad hoc methods which are, make sense, you know, how to prevent them from overfitting. Right? So they, 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 that's why I think there's been a lot of interest in artificial neural networks. So, <clears throat> so, so the, you know, some of the most popular, you know, purpose-built neural networks that you guys, you know, have been, have been all the craze, you know, in recent years, right? So one is the, the convolution neural networks, right? And this is a picture I stole from a textbook. Uh, so, <clears throat> so you guys probably have heard convolution neural networks. So those are the type of neural networks that are designed to recognize images and objects and so forth. Okay, so, so usually those things are deep, okay? And, uh, and the idea is the depth of the neural network is designed in such a way so that you gener you, 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 they're designed to capture features at the successively le higher level of complexity, right? So some sort of a, you know, edge detector and corners and contours, you know, object parts and so forth, okay? And, and those are, what I said, they are, they are purpose-built and uh, because they're, they're really designed to deal with 1D, 2D, 3D kind of signals, like images, audio, and, uh, and, and video, okay? And the structure of those networks, the, 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 the reason they're called convolutional neural networks is those weights that I mentioned, they're actually shared among all of those guys that so they're really meant to pick up essentially edges and shapes. I mean, those, those are, you know, rationally designed neural networks. It's not like you know, my vanilla neural network put connections, right? So, but have been very powerful for, for, for image recognition. And again, the primary reason for that is because I have tons of training data, 
Right, so <clears throat> and then the other class of neural networks that have become very popular for, again, for, for, for domains is those are the networks that are specially designed to model arbitrary length sequence and non-local dependencies. Okay? So those are the, 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 the name of those neural networks are go by things like uh, recurring neural networks, you know, bidirectional recurring neural networks, or long short term memory you know, uh, neural networks. So those are the type of neural networks that they use to model language. Now you guys, I'm sure you have seen all the buzzwords about you know, Google Translate, you know, uh, you know, automatically generating uh, uh, songs, right? You know, the, the music generation stuff, right? Uh, I mean, those things are really based on this type of ideas. And the reason it's called recurrent or long short term memory, the idea is instead of getting the input to output, right, as the, as, as the training process is done, the, those are recurring neural networks. You know, part of the previous input also is used to impact the, the thing that follows up. And those things are meant to model sequences, right? If you, if you think about a text, right, you know, as I parse the text, right, you know, I would like to be able to model that right before that in certain length something else came. Right? So this is the long, long distance and short distance kind of dependencies. And those, again, you know, specially designed topologies, right, that allow you to capture some of that stuff, okay? But again, this is another domain in which I have a lot of data to train those models, right? I mean, parallel texts, uh, especially in European language, there are tons of them, thanks to EU, right? Because, you know, those guys, they have to publish everything at least, you know, four or five languages, okay? So you have all those parallel texts, right? And you can train those models. You can have, you know, very good, you know, automatic translators. Okay, uh, the, uh, I think you know, some of the stuff in terms of the music generation is actually very good because those are technically unsupervised, right? But to some extent, the existing song or the melody is a supervision, okay? And the way those things are trained is actually very, very interesting is the models are trained so that given five notes or five chunks of music, predict the sixth. Right? So in other words, I mean, the songs themselves become the training sets, okay? And, and then you give something, a, a model like that, you know, initial set of notes, and then we'll go on and start generating the rest and the rest and the rest, right? I mean, I mean you can, you know, keep on predicting, right? But, you know, that requires a lot of data, you know, to do some of that stuff, right? And a, a lot of, you know, computational power. But the, the, it's an exciting area, uh, but, you know, <clears throat> some data is required. And just spend two or three, no, ten minutes to introduce SVMs. So, so the history is something like that. Artificial neural networks came first, like 30 plus years ago. Okay, uh, then people realize that you know, man, we need a lot of computing power, and those things get stuck in local minima. Okay, so support vector machines were introduced right around that time, and they just took off because the <clears throat> the underlying optimization problem is convex which means you know, they will not get stuck in local minima. So we'll find the global optimal solution to the problem they're trying to solve, right? And, um, and can be, we have efficient algorithms for training them, right? And those guys you know, took off. And then uh, really to a large extent, GPGPU came around. And then uh, you know, that thing came around. And then neural networks took off again. So we'll see what happens. So if, if I was giving you that presentation 10 years ago, you know, nobody would be paying attention to the artificial neural networks and everybody would be paying attention to SVM. You know, that, that was the hot thing 10 years ago, okay? So support vector machines are very simple. They, 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 they start by a very simple concept, right? So the, the whole idea of linear separators. Squares and circles, they have to be consistent with my shapes, right? <clears throat> and, and what I want to do is I want to find a hyperplane that separates them. Okay, those things are separable, right? So, so here's a line, okay? Uh, here's another line. Here's a bunch of other lines, okay? So I have multiple lines that will separate those two. Okay, great. Uh, which one is the right line? Which one should I pick? The diagonal that, that, that looks better. Looks better? Okay. How do I code that looks better? Ah, ah no. Black magic, right? So, so the idea is, the, the, and, and so there's a notion of really what you want to line that is in the middle of the white space, you know, conceptually, right? I mean, as much in the middle as possible. 
Why you do that? Well, you want that whatever, if your decision, if your model says if you're on the one side, call it green, if you're on the other side, call it you know, red, right? You, you want to have you know, as much leeway as, ha as possible to, eh, to get a little bit off, right? Because you have say, a lot of white threads, okay? So this is called the, the maximum margin linear separator, okay? So, <clears throat> so, so the, there's an interesting way of, of actually mathematically defining that, right? But uh, so I have an equation of a line, <coughs> which is that. If you guys go back, it's an you know, equation of a line, right? You know, so this is a way of writing an equation of a line, okay? And if I look at that line over here, uh, then uh, if I look two points x and y over here, then uh, then for that one point on that line, that thing will be zero. The other point on that line, that thing will be zero. That's how you define the line. You take the difference of those things. I have something like that, okay? That means that linear, that w that comes into that linear equation is actually the norm on that line. Okay, so, so when you have a line equation like that, right, x is a data point, right? Uh, b, you know, x is something that goes along the line, right? B is an offset, okay? So w is actually the norm on that line, okay? So, so anyway, so I have that, that W that, that corresponds to the norm of that line, and I want to define the maximum margin. So long story short, the margin uh, is defined to uh, end up being, you know, this is mathematic derivation, something like two divided by, by the length of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the norm, okay? So that's the margin, the measure of the margin, right? So the optimization problem then becomes something like that. You know, find the line, right, that maximizes the margin, right? That leads to a, to a problem that, uh, that looks something like that, okay? That's the optimization problem, right? Which uh, you solve it by using, you know, what's called a Lagrange multiplier kind of uh, formulation that, uh, <coughs> The list is something like that, right? Which is a quadratic convex optimization problem. Okay, so, so this is the quadratic optimization problem, which is convex. Okay, so so you can solve those problems really efficient. Okay, uh, and uh, and, the, and the beauty of that is that uh, it's it's very hard to. Uh, the reason that it's called support vector machines. Let me. Uh, I'm sorry. Is that once you do the math, that line, right, that line over here is defined by those two points that are the first points that hit that line if it shifts, okay? And those are called the support vectors of that line, and that's why the thing is called support vector machines. Just the whole discussion is why the name, where the name comes from, right? So that line is defined by essentially the points of the two different classes, right, that help support, that help define that line, or closest to, to that line, right? And this is called this, in the support vectors of that method, right? And if you guys have taken optimization course, those are the, those are the points whose corresponding Langrange multipliers are not negative, everything else is negative, because the, the Langrange multipliers are used to, to satisfy constraints, and those are the ones that Unless I do not have them there, they will violate the constraints. Okay, so so, so long story short, the linear support vector machines is trying to estimate a line like that, right? That goes in the middle, right, and gives them the maximum margin. <coughs> so if the points are not linearly separable, like here, right? So you see the the squares over here have some circles and so forth. This is not linearly separable. Okay. Then uh, the way you, you handle that thing in the support vector machine is uh, <coughs> you introduce something which is called some of a slack variable. Oh, no, it's not introduced that way. You essentially, you, you allow yourself to have certain things misclassified and you pay a penalty for it. And that's the best way to explain it. You know, mathematically it's done via, via a concept called slack variables, right? But essentially what he says is, that, well, I don't want to classify everything correctly. I will I potentially will allow some misclassification error, but for everything that I misclassify, I have some sort of a penalty that I pay, right? And the penalty is a fudge parameter that the user defines, 
this is like a user controllable penalty function for the misclassified. Okay? So based on that, then essentially you tend to ignore some of those guys and you, you still look for the support vector over here. Okay? That's one way to do it. But the most powerful way of a support vector machines is that <clears throat> another way of dealing with the non-separability is by taking the points in, in that space and projecting them to a higher dimensional space in which things are separable. Okay? <clears throat> so I'll, I'll, I'll rely on your visual thing. So if I look at the points over here, right? And if you were in the open house, there was a very, I don't know, John had a very nice animation for that, right? So I have the points in the circle, right? And the other stuff over there, right? So this is flat like that, right? If I take the circle stuff and start pulling them like that, right? So it becomes some sort of an eclipse like that. The, the circles are the point, the, and the other guys are here, and I can cut it like that. So I took the points in 2D, I project them in 3D. You guys okay with that? Right, by, by my projection, is a nonlinear projection. The stuff around the circle project higher in 3D than the rest of the stuff, okay? And then all of a sudden, it can be cut via 2D plane. You okay with that visual? Okay, so, <clears throat> so then even those points in a low dimensional space may not be separable, projection of those points to a high dimensional space can make them separable, okay? So, so then the, the, the beauty of support vector machines is that one way of dealing with that non-separability is to actually do that projection, you know? And uh, now, this is not a new idea, that's an old idea, okay? Support vector machines did not invent that idea. But what is interesting about support vector machines uh, And again, I'm going to give you a very high-level idea. Once you work out the math, so phi xi is the point in the original feature space. Phi is the point in that transformed feature space. Okay, so phi is a, is a, is a transformation function, right? That I will take, say, a, a point in 2D and map it in a point in, you know, gazillions D. Okay, gazillions is a unit of measure, right? <laughs> okay? And, and that phi of that times phi of that is essentially the dot product of those vectors in that projected space, right? So the optimization problem becomes something like that that involves the dot products of the projections, okay? And the beauty about that dot product of the projections for certain type of projections, right? I can compute that without realizing the projected representation of that point. Let me tell you what I mean by that. So I have a, a, a point in, in, in a, in a, in a, in a three-dimensional space, right? So let's say I have a way, I can project that point into a 20-dimensional space, right? So they go from three to 20 dimensions. I have a 20-dimensional vector. I have another 20-dimensional vector that came from a three-dimensional vector. Compute the dot products <coughs> that will give me that thing over here. Okay? Now, for certain uh, projections, for certain type of projections, right, I can compute the dot product in the three-dimensional space and then apply an operator on that, and that will be the same as projecting them first and computing the dot product afterwards. You guys okay with that? Now, so in other words, I compute the dot product on 3D or do something else, right? And then I, I perform some sort of a transformation, right? And, and a very simple thing for you guys to think is something like that. If I look X and Y transpose, right, so the dot product of two vectors, right? Raise the thing to the kth power, right? That part involves terms if you actually expand the thing out, right? Will involve terms in which the equivalent of taking x and y and projecting to the kth power and then computing a dot product. Okay? So, so then the advantage is, is for certain transformations, I can do that operation without the expensive first step of projecting into a space. 
okay? Especially if that projection will involve an infinite dimensional space. Okay? <laughs> so I can project something on an infinite dimensional space, right? And then compute that product there. So, so let me, you know, it, so if I have a function x, right, and I do an e of x, exponent to the power of x, right? I can approximate that e of x via Taylor's expansion to something like that, right? That keeps on going. Right? That's an infinite dimensional space that is associated with e to, uh, to the raised to the power of x. Okay? So, <clears throat> so anyway, so the, 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 the reason that you know, uh, SVMs became very popular is because for certain, people realize that for certain projections, I can realize the benefit of that projection without the cost associated with that. I mean, long story short. Okay? And, uh, and, and then really the, the whole idea of supervised learning with SVM has become that of designing these functions that will do those projections, right, into feature spaces that they are relevant for the problem at hand. Okay? So, so, so the, the metrics that I get by having the pairwise projections of all my training instances, right, you know, the dot products of those projections is, is called the kernel metrics. So the whole research in support vector machine became in designing those kernel matrices. Okay? So the kernel matrices have to have certain properties. You know, they have to be uh, symmetric positive definite, uh, uh, satisfied a bunch of other conditions. Okay? But once they satisfy, then that problem can be solved efficiently. Right? And then you can realize the benefit of operating in an extremely high dimensional space without the cost associated with doing that. Okay? So. <clears throat> okay, so yeah. More headaches. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of black magic then involved in. Designing the function, yes. Yes. Okay. That, that's not black magic. There's a lot of domain knowledge that needs to get in here to design the function, okay? Let me give you guys some idea about what I mean by domain knowledge, right? So one of the problems that you know, my group have focused in the past uh, significantly is that of classifying biological sequences, right? And whether or not a particular sequence is, is, let's say, of a particular protein family or not, right? So the objects over there, the, the instances that you're trying to classify is a, a protein amino acid sequence, right? So those, those the X sub I's and the Z's and those things, right? So those are Sequence, those are what the objects, okay? So, so the question there becomes, you know, what is the feature representation of a sequence? That's a <coughs> deep question, right? But I don't really care about that. What I want to care is to be able to compute, you know, something like that, xi, xj, right, between a pair of sequences. You know, the, the kernel value between a pair of sequences, right? And, and really, what, what the kernel function really captures, if you think what the, the dot product is, a dot product is really a measure of similarity. If the vectors are unit length, that product is the cosine between the two vectors. A high value means that the vectors point in the same direction. Low value, zero value means the vectors are orthogonal, right? So based on that, then you have a conceptual notion that that thing is a measure of similarity between this guy and this guy. That's really what what a kernel function between two vectors are, two points are, or the dot product between two points, two, two, two vectors. It's a measure of similarity, okay? So knowing that stuff and knowing, okay, I want to come up with a way of computing similarity between two sequences so I can fit them into here, then the research, not, not just our research, but the research in the field who was working on that problem became, how do I design kernel function for sequences, right? that compute meaningful similarities that also satisfy the conditions of being a kernel matrix, okay? And it turns out to here, you know, things like actually computing, uh, what does now work is, is, uh, is doing some, for example, the score of the, the global sequence alignment between those two sequences. Like you take those sequences, compute the alignment, like a maximum common subsequence or something like that, like an eddy distance, right? That thing violates the kernel, the, the Mercer's conditions for being a kernel. Right? But I can, 
I can compare how many common k-mers they have, or how many common subsequents they have, right? And that will satisfy the conditions of a kernel, okay? And, and that's where the black magic is. Now, you realize that that kernel is a measure of similarity, and then based on your domain, it says, if I'm classifying sequences, that is the right way of measuring similarities. If I'm classifying web pages, that's the right way of measuring similarities. If I'm classifying video, that's the right way of measuring similarity. And that thing becomes your kernel function that you feed the support vector machine. That's where the black magic is in that. Everywhere there is black magic. Now, I don't want to derail things here, but... No, I think, I think we're done, because... Question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, so when you do research in this, right, and, and you're going to publish your paper, what is that paper about? <laughs> right? No, because I see, I see two, two different things. So they, they, you, they, have they, a problem. you have a problem, and you want to come up with... with tune this somehow or come up with this uh, matrix or way of separating or, or classifying these things. And then you get bang up results. Yeah. Right. So, so you the, publish about that. Yeah. So the, the research in, in, in learning, in supervised learning, is really in a couple of things, right? Let's say within a kind of support working machine, the research is going to be there, you know, what are the right kernels for different problems? Right? So so how do you, because that's what I'm interested, that seems like a very interesting problem. Yes. How do you that, that, yes. So you say if I have a problem of this character, yeah. this is the kind of kernel. Okay. Yeah. That, that's exactly. That, that's the research. So, so there are a couple of research. Number one is, can I speed up the optimization algorithm? This is you know there's a numerical optimization going on in actually solving those you know quadratic pro programming problems. Okay. And there's a lot of research. It's pretty mature at this point in time that has actually you know high and fast optimization algorithm that can actually converge very fast. Okay, uh, that's a line of research. Another line of research is, you know, how do I design kernel functions for different classes of problems? This is the same thing as a neural network. How do I design classes of topologies? You know, classes of, of, of essentially, you know, in communication between the variables, right? That, that are designed to capture, you know, different characteristics of the data, right? Because at the end of the day, if you look at some of the most successful neural networks, have a component to capture convolution. They have some that have to do a recurring neural network. They have you know 50 of those guys to do the ensembling, and a bunch of stuff, right? I mean, each of those things is really it's a, it's a recognition module for a particular signal that particular data application requires. And then the question becomes that really of a signal detector. You know, how do we design the best signal detector for for edges? You know, for for uh, uh, I mean, in, in, uh, <clears throat> in text uh, understanding has to do with the whole idea of attention. You know, how do I link, uh, link you know, relatively long distance interactions within a sentence of things that are actually tied together? So that's where the research is. On the numerical side, on optimization side, and on how do I design those things that can model my data and I think some of the deep theoretical research on machine learning has to do with what can I say about generalization errors? It has to do with the learning capacity, you know, the ability of the classifier to, to deal with, uh, uh, with things that they are out of sample or within the sample and so forth. So, so okay. Because are you interested in switching? Pardon? Are you interested in switching? No, <laughs> but, but I think that we as, as software engineers are gonna be faced with this this problem, right? Because you're going to be using some machine learning algorithms to help solve the kinds of problems that we're interested in solving, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that some some poor app is going to have to come up with this and, and tune these systems, yeah. right? And the more so, I don't know what, if you want to call it patterns or guidance or methodology to do that. Yeah. Means well, you can, it's, it becomes more of a, a, I don't know, heuristic or a, an engineering discipline and less of black magic, right? That's true. I mean, a lot of the software engineering stuff, you know, at least, you know, trying to model code, right? I mean, code, I mean, the best way to model code is via the sequence models, right? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> the best way to model code is 
we had a bunch of the sequence models. You know, people have developed models to model sequences. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those arbitrary length sequences that they have potentially short-term and long-term dependencies. Yeah, but I'm not interested in modeling code. I'm interested in, you know, these guys are going to be building systems where on the input side, you might need a, a classifier of some sort, mm -hmm. right? And, and you're not just going to buy one, crack the box open, and it works. You're going to have to do, there's a lot of black magic going into that, right? Where do you yes. find the engineering knowledge to, without hiring a $600,000 a year expert in this? But it, it sounds like, though, that it comes back ultimately to the domain knowledge, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, which is kind of our, it puts even more value on that. If you don't know the problem space, you're probably not going to make that leap to classifying the small pieces, right? That are going to get you there. Right, which, which comes into all of you, really. I mean, the more yeah. domain knowledge you have, the better you're going to be yeah. in that domain because you do understand requirements, do understand things in, in a way that some outsider wouldn't. But even with that, you need a lot of skill to be able to piece together it. A software system, you add this to it, this is a completely different skill set. So, I mean, on that, I, I know, like, um, I've been seeing, you know, when you talk about like neuronets being the buzzword and like, uh, like Google's TensorFlow, which is supposed to be very easy to use for categorizing. Like, what is, what are like off the shelf tools like that? Well, I mean, I mean, there are tons of off-the-shelf tools. It's not so much about, you know, uh, training the model once you have designed the structure, right? I mean, the, I mean, a TensorFlow is nothing more than essentially the optimization algorithm, yeah. right? I mean, that's one thing when I do stuff on an SVM, for instance. My goal is to build that. Once I have that, I'll use an off-the-shelf optimization algorithm to solve the problem, right? I mean, that's really what TensorFlow is, right? But the question that becomes, you know, what is the, the network structure that it will be using? with TensorFlow. I mean, the, the, there's a very good book on uh, neural networks published the last year or so, uh, Good Fellow and Company, the, the, the guys behind in uh, Google Brain stuff, right? In which you actually, if you read, you know, half the book, it's really about uh, uh, guidelines of how, you know, of essentially topology guidelines, you know, what, what, what each different neural network topology, you know, characteristics is able to it's good for, right? I mean, once you understand, okay, my problem has this type of characteristics, right? And you know, that's your domain knowledge comes in, right? And, and then, okay, this characteristic, I need that capability. That characteristic, I need that capability, and so forth. And you have to build, essentially, the topology of your neural network. And you have to determine how many levels you want to be, and so forth. Then training it, you can use TensorFlow, you can use any, any, any of the tools out there. I mean, the, 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 those tools will not, will not tell you, I mean, will not infer for you the right topology. I, I guess what I'm really asking is, like, as you keep saying, there's a lot of black magic in here. But I, I mean, the black magic is the wrong term. There's a lot of domain knowledge that you need to have, both from the application as yeah. well as from the capability of the tools. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's black magic because you don't know what's going on. I mean, you don't have the domain knowledge, right? And once you have the domain knowledge, it becomes less of a black magic. Yeah, I mean, no, you can argue that with <laughs> anything we yeah. do too. I mean, it's good design from the bad design. Yes, it kind of works, but this one is, there's a lot of black magic going into that also. It's just that we've been doing it a lot longer, so there are libraries written on design patterns, architectural patterns, other kinds of things. There are probably <laughs> similar things until they come up with some new whiz-bang method of doing things. And... All right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not as bad. I mean, I mean once you, you read, you, you gain some experience, it's much less of a black magic as you think it is. I mean, from the outside, everything looks like a black magic, right? But, and, you know, but once you start doing that, so, okay, this is what they're doing and so forth. And, and some things are... I mean, there are certain elements that are still, I will not say black magic, simply we don't have a good solution. So essentially what do we do? We do a, a, a very extensive parameter search. I mean, one of the reasons why, you know, learning those models take a long time is there are those user tunable parameters that control, for instance, you know, what is the trade-off between accuracy and, and, uh, and model complexity, okay? So depending on the method, there are usually one, two, three, four, five parameters that control that. 
you don't know ahead of time what are the right values. What do you do? You do a grid search. You know, doing a grid search over four variables, each of them taking you know, 50 possible values, right? That, that will, that will, you know, that's how my students spend millions of hours on, on the MSI supercomputers. You know, they, they do a parameter strip to try to figure out the best model. So, MSI is Minnesota Supercomputer Institute. Uh, about, uh, about yeah. <laughs> you overfitting and underfitting. Yep. Uh, so, uh, in a continuous continuous function case, uh, essentially becomes like an interpolation problem. And uh, so, if you do a Fourier uh, analysis, <coughs> you can have uh, uh, a frequency distribution looking at the data. Mm -hmm. And if you know, because a generalized problem, right? you're trying to solve a generalized equation. Mm -hmm. So you know the bound of your um, minimum frequency and maximum frequency. So you can isolate what is going to be error, and it's it's going to be you, as, as you add complexity to your system, mm -hmm. you're going to have higher frequency, and then at some point it's going to pick up the noise, it's going to start mm -hmm. modeling the noise, and that will be high frequency. Versus if it's a generalized, it's a low frequency. So based on that that principle, uh, are there other types of principles similar that allows you to uh, design right off the bat, you know, good uh, generalization rules or, or designing <laughs> rules? Uh, so that you know when you have achieved a good uh, set of weights, a uh, good neural network versus, you know, like the black magic we've been talking about? Yeah, I mean, for neural networks and, and the whole idea of overfeeding, I mean, I need to pull out a slide, uh, is uh, I, I think people are still trying to figure out, you know, the principles behind overfeeding and controlling that. But l let, me, let me introduce something that, you know, I skipped, but it's just, just a general idea. Uh, uh, is that projecting? <coughs> okay, so, <clears throat> so this, is a, this is a model of what's called ridge regression, right? So... So, so the, 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 the problem over here is not to classify. The problem is to actually uh, estimate a continuous value y. So y is what I'm trying to estimate, right? Uh, uh, x is a metric in which every row is, a, is an example, right? You know, for which I apply some sort of linear uh, function, so like a dot product, right? And I want to estimate a particular value, right? So this is almost like a classification, but I'm, I'm trying to not take plus one, minus one. I'm trying to predict a value, right? And, and I measure the quality of my fit by taking essentially the, the, uh, the, the squared error. Right? So the difference is predicted versus the actual one, and I have a squared error. Right? So that part over here, this is a standard re linear regression model. Okay? The thing to the right, right is something that, that is used to help generalization. Okay? So if I didn't have that over here, is I'm trying to find the model W that will give me the most accurate model that will try to minimize the error. That thing is the error. Okay? And then what I said, well, in addition of minimizing the error, I also want to minimize the norm of my model. Right? So this is, this is the, the, the squared norm right, of, of the model. Okay? So, so this is some sort of a notion of a model complexity, right? So, so if, if I have a model that, you know, those are, this, is a, this is a vector of values, right? If I have a model that some entries over there are large values, I will call it a complex model, right? If all of the entries over there have small values, that's good, okay? So I'm trying really to squash large values in my model over here, right? By having something like that, okay? And people have found out that this way of creating what's called a multi-criteria or two-criteria optimization problem, in which I'm trying to minimize the error, plus I'm trying to squash large values, that's another way of thinking of it, right, is a good way of, of controlling model complexity. And lambda here, right, is a fudge factor, in which you as a designer, right, you're going to figure out the trade-off between my error and my ability to squash the large values, right? If lambda is extremely high, 
right? The preferred W would be the one that has all zeros. You guys agree with that? Because I mean, this is a multi-objective optimization problem, right? Minimize error, minimize the magnitude of, of W, right? Lambda controls the, the, the knob, right? If my lambda is extremely high, then the solution to that will give me probably W equals zero, right? That, the, that essentially will not feed anything. If lambda is equal to zero, you know, I couldn't care about large values, okay? So, so this is usually, you know, what you have in, in pretty much any learning method, right? So you have some sort of a parameter that, that you incorporate with your objective, right? It's something about com model complexity, and you have some sort of a knob that you, that you twist, right? And, and as far as I know, there are no principal ways other than exploring the knob, right, in setting that. Okay, I mean, this is, this is something that, you know, it's, 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 it's essentially what's called a model selection. <coughs> so you have to search over the whole space of models as parameterized by lambda to find the best model, right? There's, there's, a, there's a whole class of methods that based on Bayesian learning, <coughs> right? that essentially they, as part of the model, they select the best model in a Bayesian set, setting, okay? And, and those, you know, they claim, right? You know, at least from the theory, that's true, right? They do not have to do that, you know, as part of the whole estimating the model in a Bayesian fashion, right? They, they actually estimate the optimal hyperparameters of the model. So those are the fancy term called hyperparameters. So W is the parameters of the model, and so lambda is like a hyperparameter of the model, okay? Because it helps in selecting the model, okay? So you don't have to worry about hyperparameter selection, right? But computationally, they, they go through some exercise of selecting really the best model out of here, right? And, and this is really the, the state of the art in many of those things. Now. In some methods, like a rich regression that has been studied to death, we have a nice way of capturing that. In things like neural networks, right, it's not a single parameter that we need to tune. Right? And, uh, there's a significantly more set of parameters that I have to deal with. So, so yeah, I don't think we are anywhere clear there to, to having an analytical way of saying, you know, here is how to, to prevent generalization. So. I think there are a lot of interesting problems to, probably from a software engineering sort of engineering perspective to look to look at. Well, let's thank George. Thanks, George. Thank you, guys.